we're going to continue talking about relationships. I think everybody wants to have happy relationships. Nobody wants there to be a strain in their relationships. Nobody wants there to be strife in their relationships. People want to be able to get along. People want to be able to enjoy one another. That's why we get married. That's why we have families. We don't want separation. We don't want disconnect. We don't want a family and children to grow up and won't communicate with us. We really desire to be a people, and you're created by God to be a people that longs for relationships and longs to be connected not only with God but with other people. And we chose to focus on the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And we chose to change the name of those Ten Commandments and call them Ten Virtues. And we felt like if we would allow God to develop these virtues in us, it would be these Ten Virtues that would cause our relationships to be successful, would cause us to enjoy one another. It would enable us to connect with one another. Each of them are very simple. For example, the first one, just put God first. That commandment or virtue is have no other God before you. It means that your relationships in life will be successful if you put God first. Don't worry about what somebody else does. You always say, I'm putting God first. I'm going to honor God. And as you do, you'll find that your heart is able to connect with people, to care about people, to comfort people, and to help them. We looked at another commandment that said we're not to bear false witness, and we did the antithesis of that and said, hey, let's be honest people. Why? Because honesty is one of the number one things that causes intimacy. If you want intimacy with people, then it requires honesty. If you want to be connected with people, it requires honesty. It requires you being willing to allow God to develop in you an honest heart, a heart that doesn't lie or hide things or keep secrets. Today our main text will be Exodus 20 and 14, and it says this, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So we're going to be talking about adultery. But we're going to get, take the antithesis of that, which to me is integrity. And so we're really going to focus in on an idea called integrity, and we're going to see what that does inside of you and what that does inside of me, which is going to strengthen our relationships. I want to look at three ideas when it comes to integrity. The first one is we're going to see integrity defined. We really have to know what integrity is. And after we see integrity defined, then we're going to talk about integrity, integrity, uh, just a second, I'll tell you, lost my thought. Integrity renounces. We're going to talk about what integrity renounces and how it renounces. Then we're going to talk about integrity rejoices. Three simple thoughts. Our first one, integrity defined. Our text is Proverbs 30. Each of you have probably read these and wondered about this, but in Proverbs 30 and 18, here's what it says. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, the writer says. Yes, there are four that I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Such is the way of an adulterous woman or man. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. I want you to notice that the writer is taking these four separate things and saying there's a common denominator in each one of these that, that relates to an adulterous person or an adulterous heart, says, well, there's the way of an eagle in the sky. 
There's the way of a serpent on the rock, and there's the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and there's the way of a man with a maid. And the common denominator between them is really simple. When an eagle flies through the sky and it goes from point A to point B, it leaves no evidence behind. It leaves no trail behind. You can't track that eagle. It's the same way with a snake upon a rock. The snake leaves no evidence that it's been there. There's no way to know it's been there. There's no trail. There's no tracking ability. And the same thing is for a, sh a ship upon the midst of the sea. That ship can go the whole way across the Pacific Ocean and it would reach its destination, but you have no way to tell where it came from, how it got there. There was no way to track it. And it's the same way with a man with a maid when he's when he's pursuing his girlfriend, so to speak, you don't know what he's doing. There's no way to track how he wins her heart. And so all it's saying is this, is it's talking about adultery, and it's talking about a heart of adultery. And it's simply saying that adultery is when you allow hidden things inside of you that nobody knows about. It's talking about when we have a secret life. It's talking about when we do things that nobody can track, nobody can follow. It's talking about a life that's hidden. It's talking about a behavior of stuff taking place inside of us that nobody knows is going on. There's no tracking device. There's no evidence of it. Jesus went on and he talked about this type of heart. And here's what he said. He said, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust, after he hath committed adultery, he, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust, after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So you see, when Jesus talks about adultery, he's not talking about the act so much as he's talking about the heart. And he's trying to say that there's a spirit. It's called the spirit of adultery. It's a very real force. It's a very real spirit. It's a spirit that wants to come and visit people to cause them to begin to do hidden things, to live hidden lives. We live in a culture today that it promotes nothing but secrecy. You have an internet that people can have numerous accounts that nobody even knows they know. They can be on sites and they can have apps that don't even show up on their phone or on their computer. They can participate in lifestyles and do things that are so vile and so wicked and so wrong. It's the culture that we live in today. It is a spirit and that spirit will visit people because it wants them to do little things that create a hidden life inside of them. I landed on a plane many years ago and I landed in Thailand. I've been traveling a really long time. I was going by myself. I was exhausted. And it was about midnight when my plane landed. So by 1 or 1.30, I made it to the room. I laid down. I had to be up by 5 a.m. to catch my next flight. I was really exhausted. My body was not on the right schedule. And so it's real hard to fall asleep. Finally, I fell asleep. And at 3 a.m., my phone rings. I'm thinking, who is calling me in Thailand? I wake up and I pick the phone up and there's a female on the phone and she says, Mr. Stenick, would you like a young lady to be sent up to the room? I about lost my mind. I thought, how dare you call me in the middle of the night and wake me up? And, of course, I said, no, I don't want nobody sent up to my room. What is wrong with you people? And I hung the phone up, and I fell back asleep, thank God, slept for a few more hours and got up, and I caught my plane, and I left. But I knew that I was staying in the same hotel on the way back, and I was pretty ticked off. 
And so when I got back from my trip a couple weeks later, I stopped, I landed in Thailand. I went to the same hotel when I checked in. And when I was all done checking in, here's all these people standing at this counter at this nice hotel. And I'm finished. And I said, excuse me, ma'am. And of course, I tried to make sure I said it loud enough so everybody could hear me. I wanted all the people behind the counter to understand. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I said, let me explain something to you. I've stayed here before. When I stayed here on my trip coming in, I said, you people called me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And you asked me if I wanted a woman to be sent up to my room. I said, I better not get a call tonight. I said, if I get a call tonight, I want you to know there's going to be a problem. I said, do you understand me? And I'm telling you these Little girls, bless their heart, they hung their head. They wouldn't even look at me. And everybody at the countertops, counters looking like, God, what's this guy doing? And I'm just telling you, there is a spirit. It is the spirit of adultery. It is real. It is vile. It is unclean. And it wants to destroy relationships wants to destroy marriages, and it doesn't come in and it doesn't tell you to act things out that are just absolutely wrong. It wants you to begin to do a little hidden thing in your heart that nobody knows about. You live in that world and nobody else knows it's there and nobody else knows it exists and it's like a serpent upon a rock. There's no way to track it. There's no way for anybody to help you. There's no way for anybody to see it because you live in that hidden place. It became a problem. It became such a serious problem in the early church. This spirit of adultery that was in the earth. That on the island of Patmos, God, God had a, gave John a revelation of Jesus Christ. That meant the light turned on and John saw Jesus Christ for who he really was. And the glory of his life, his presence, and the light of his presence was so clear to John that when that light turned on, it exposed the roaches, the rats, and the mice that were still in the picture. And John saw some of the problems or the roaches or the rats or the mice that were in the early church. And he began to write to seven churches one by one to say to them when he saw the light of God's glory clearly, the light became so bright it began to expose pockets of darkness that were inside the church. And here's what he said. And unto the church in Thyatira write this. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, church. I know your love. I know your service. I know your faith. I know your patience. I know your works. It's pretty commendable. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. And it goes on. And all I wanted you to see there was there was a problem with adultery. And it wasn't just talking about the act. It's talking about stuff getting inside of us that's closed off to everybody else around us. I believe we're in a move of God right now. I believe we're in a move of God. It is stirring. There's a call that is going out. It's calling people in. There's a river that's flowing that people are getting into. There's a power and a force and a reality of Jesus Christ that's moving not just here, but it's moving across the body of Christ. There's a great stirring, but part of that move and part of that stirring is that the Spirit of God wants to begin to visit pockets of darkness that exist on the inside of us. 
Things that are hidden, things that are closed off, things that nobody knows about but God. He wants to come and he wants to put his finger on those things because he wants to bless us. He wants to help us. He wants to assist us. Does that make sense? You know, when Israel finally came out of Egypt, the first thing God said, would you stop at Mount Sinai? You stop right here. And he gave them a warning. And his warning was really simple. He said, do not let hidden things in your heart. He was saying, I want to build a new culture of people. I want to raise up an entire new culture of people. And I want this culture of people to have longevity. I want this culture of people to be connected, to care about each other. To love one another. To sacrifice for one another. To give our best to one another. I want this culture to be able to withstand the forces of darkness and the spirits of darkness that are in the earth. But if this culture is going to be sustained long term and be successful and its people be connected and want to remain connected, you cannot let hidden things in your heart. You cannot. You cannot do that. It's what Ankin did. They experienced amazing victory coming out of Jericho. I mean, God did the impossible. The walls were crushed down. Israel spoiled the enemy. Not one soul was lost. They saw an amazing victory, and God said to them, Listen, Jericho is the first fruits of the promised land. And he said, Because it's the first fruits of the promised land, all the gold, all the silver, all the spoils and all the blessings in the promised land belong to me. That's what God said. The first fruits belong to him. And there was a guy in the Bible by the name of Ankin that said, I got to have some of that gold and silver. So in the night he snuck some of that gold and silver into his pouch and then he went and he dug a hole in the ground. He dug it up real good, put his gold in there, put his silver in there, hid it. Then he said, I'm going to put my tent over top of it so no one noticed that the dirt was dug. But guess who noticed? God noticed. And so the Israelites went up to fight the next group of people in the army of Ai. And there were only 3,000 people that went up to fight this group because it was just a small little group of people. And Israel sent 3,000 people up, but they lost men in the battle when they were defeated. And of course, you got Joshua on the ground throwing dirt on himself, crying and moaning to God and saying, why am I having no victory? Why can't I move forward? Why are we stuck? Why aren't we able to get along? Why aren't we able to go any further? Why do we seem like we're stuck? Why do I continue to run into this problem again? And God said, Joshua, get up, man. There's something hidden in the house. There's something hidden in the house. It's causing a problem. It's causing a defeat. And of course, little by little, exposure came until Ankin stood there. And you know, it cost Ankin his life and all his family. That's what adultery does. That's what that spirit does. It destroys people's heart. And it destroys their family. And it destroys everything. It doesn't matter if you're acting it out. It's what's hidden inside you that brings the destruction. Now, I appreciate all the shouts, all the running, man. I mean, hallelujah. I'm telling you, all are fired up today. <laughs> Darn, someone said I should have stayed home today. <laughs> Listen, integrity learns how to renounce things. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 2, listen to this. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, 
not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The word renounce means to disown or to push away. You and I are going to have to learn how to renounce the hidden things. We're going to have to learn how to push away stuff from us because how many of you know stuff will come and visit you stuff will come and knock on your door stuff will come and try to talk to you but you're going to have to learn how to renounce it and how to push it away from you and there's two primary ways I think there's a handful of other ways but I'm going to give you two primary ways that you're going to learn how to renounce things that are very easy and very simple to do the first way is you're going to learn to renounce them by the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and 23, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. In other words, he was saying this. He's saying that through the Holy Spirit, you're going to be empowered to do something. In other words, the Holy Spirit is going to visit you. He's going to come to you. You don't have to ask him to. You don't have to hold your hand up and say, I need you. He's going to come to you because he loves you. He's going to come to you and he's going to put his finger on those pockets of darkness that exist on the inside of us as people. He's going to put his finger on things inside of us, things that are hidden, things that no one knows is there. He's going to put his finger on them because he wants to help you. He wants to help you purify your soul. He wants this stuff out of you because it hurts your family. It hurts your heart. It hurts the people around you. It hurts the body of Christ. Do you know that you are connected to me? And even if I don't want you to be connected to me, I've got you and you've got me. And I would really appreciate it if you would honor me enough to keep your heart clean. Because I'm doing everything I can do to keep my heart as clean and as honorable as I possibly can for your sake and for the sake of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And so you're not your own person and you don't live alone and it's not your life. Okay, it's not your life. Your life affects my life. And my life affects your life. I say to my children all the time, no, it's not your life. Your life affects me. You don't get to always do what you want to do. Sometimes you have to do and you have to say to yourself, does this affect dad? Well, no one should control me. You know that that's true. No one should control you. And as I explain to my children, I'm not trying to control you. I, that's the last thing I want to do. I have enough problems controlling me. I don't want to have to control anybody else. That's a big job. But your life affects me. And so you need to take into consideration what you do. You need to look beyond you. And you need to say, how's that affect the church? How's that affect the pastors? How's that affect my wife? How's that affect my name? How's that affect my children? You see, but if the Holy Spirit comes to you and he puts his finger on pockets of darkness, I want you to know when he comes, power comes with him. And the moment he touches that pocket of darkness, there is power available to begin to push it away. Doesn't matter if the 7,000 times before that it's pushed you over. The moment he touches it, power is there to push it away. It is. It's there. You just have to go with it. You have to obey the Spirit. That's why Peter said that seeing ye have purified your souls... You have gotten free from pockets of darkness. You have been delivered from hidden things on the inside of you. How is that, Peter? Obeying the truth through the Spirit. You obey 
what the Spirit tells you. It comes through Him to you. It's not important for me to ever worry about uh, managing my wife, Maureen, policing her, making sure she's doing the right things, thinking the right things, making sure her attitude's right. I never worry about her. I never think about her. I could care less what's going on on the inside of her in the sense that it's my job to manage it. It's the Holy Spirit's job to help her, to encourage her, to comfort her, to deal with her, and I let him do his job. And if she doesn't do something I like, then usually I just say, get her, Holy Ghost. <laughs> and he's my friend, and he says, I've been, I've been waiting for you to ask me. And, uh, and, then, and then other times I, I go to her and I say, hey, hey, don't do this. Don't do this. I said, I did that this morning. I said to her, I was getting ready to leave about six, and I always put my shoes in this spot. And, you know, I know exactly where they're at, and they weren't there. And I said, honey, did you touch my shoes? She said, well, I put them away for you. I said, I didn't want them put away. I want them right in my spot. And 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 and, and I, I I was like getting getting all worked up about my shoes, and she said, "You know, God's going to talk to you about coming, about coming and talking to me about your shoes." And I said, "He already did. I just couldn't stop." <laughs> he said, "Do not say something about your shoes. Just." drop it and let it go. And I thought, I just can't do it this time. <laughs> you know how we all have our quirks. I just want my shoes right here. Don't mess with my shoes. <laughs> you know, I was in Roanoke, Virginia, and uh, I, I lived there, and uh, you know, it was the strangest thing. I, I, it was just a new day, and my mind was being assaulted, assaulted with ungodly, perverse, unclean sexual thoughts. I mean, bad. It was really being assaulted. And I didn't do anything, and I hadn't done anything different. I hadn't put my eyes on anything ungodly. It was just like this bombardment in my mind, and it was hitting me all day long. And, and by the end of that day, I went to bed, and I got up the next day, and it continued. And then by the end of that day, the Spirit of God, he visited me. And, he, and, he, and this is what he said to me. Remember, it's, a, it's through the Spirit. You have to obey. You have to obey the Spirit. You have to obey. When he comes, you have to obey. You will not succeed. You will not enjoy the blessing. I do not care how much you love God. You will not walk in the blessing if the Spirit visits you and you do not listen. You can say you're the righteousness of God and all the blessings are yes, but you will not enjoy them. Okay? You are the righteousness of God and all the blessings do belong to you and you can go into God's presence no matter what at any moment, at any time, regardless of your moral code of conduct, but it is also a relationship that you must obey the Spirit. And the Spirit met me and he said to me, he said, now I'll tell you what to do if you want to get that thing to stop. He said, go tell your wife what's going on. I said, I can do that. And so I just went home and I told my wife, I said, this is what's been happening in my head for the last two days. Can you pray for me? And she said, yeah. And I said, okay. And she prayed a prayer. Maybe it lasted 60 seconds. But I'm telling you what, it's been over 30 years and it never happened again. Oh, 
I can't tell anybody what's going on inside of me. I can't tell anybody. I can't tell if they knew they would reject me. They would push me away. They, they would, they, if they knew, really? I had a good friend that thought that way. I had a good friend that thought that way. He got himself caught up into all kind of ungodly stuff. All kind of ungodly, filthy stuff. Putting his eyes on things he was watching. Sexual, ungodly, filthy, perverse stuff. He loved God. He was a friend of mine. He was a minister of the gospel. But the Spirit of God kept coming to him and saying, Knock, knock. Call Scott. Knock, knock. Call Scott. Knock, knock. Call Scott. He resisted. It cost him his marriage. But the Spirit kept knocking. Knock, knock. Call Scott. And he's like, if, oh, there's no way I can tell anybody what's going on on the inside of me. And of course, uh, finally, he did call. I thought, my God, man, what's wrong with you, dude? Why didn't you call months ago before this became a problem like it is? Well, because I thought if you all knew, you would reject me and push me away and label me and ostracize me. I thought, are you kidding me? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not only that, you come into this thing with pockets of darkness in you, whether you wanted them or not, whether you volunteered for them or not, whether you lifted your hand up and say, I want them or not. They're just there. And it might be a hard thought, but reality is sometimes we're going to have to learn how in Proverbs 28, 13, it says this. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But he who confesses and pushes it away shall find mercy. Isn't that simple? I don't think that's that hard. So, of course, uh, I met with my buddy, and, and uh, we began the process of healing and the process of restoration and the process of getting free. And, and he made it. He made it to the other side. He's free today. But he would have never made it if he had to do it on his own. And that's the number one lie that you have to get rid of. You can't do it by yourself. If you could do it by yourself, then you wouldn't need the body of Christ. But unfortunately, we need each other. Uh, that's not what I meant to say. Fortunately, we need one another. And fortunately, that's the plan of God for us to get help. The second way that you're going to learn to renounce things is strictly by the word of God. What do I mean? Proverbs 119 and 130 says, The entrance of thy word giveth light, and he giveth understanding to the simple. As you begin to read your Bible, as you begin to put the word of God in you, as you begin to hear messages preached, you listen to CDs, or watch ministries on F Facebook Live, I want you to know that when the word enters in, it brings light. And when the light comes on, it exposes roaches. It, it exposes mice and rats. And so whenever something is exposed, you simply need to move with it quickly. And I think we all have a relationship with Jesus Christ here. And we know when the light comes on. We know when the light comes on. We know when God's saying, no, 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 no. It's time to put this in the light. You, you're going to have to go with it. Because if you don't go with it, then again, you'll suffer. You'll suffer some kind of loss in your own heart. And it will begin to affect the relationships that you're in. It will hurt the relationships that you're in. But you know, one of the things that this verse in 2 Corinthians 4 and 2 talks about 
is it says this, it says, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And what happens is if you'll resist the work of the Spirit, or if you resist the work of the word inside of you, you will begin to handle the word of God deceitfully. You will begin to find scriptures that justify why you shouldn't do that. Don't have to do that why it's okay to continue in hidden things, why it's okay in this area or this area. And I'm telling you, you'll begin to handle the Word of God deceitfully. You'll begin to twist things because the paradigm in your heart is being affected by that spirit of adultery because of things that are hidden, and it will begin to affect the paradigm through which you're able to see and read the Word of God. Paul went on to say in 2 Corinthians 4, he, in the beginning, he was talking about a steward must be found faithful in the eyes of God. And then he talked about renouncing these hidden things. And then he went on and said he had a treasure in his earthen vessel. And he said this treasure was Christ and that there was power in him. There was an excellency of power. That was beyond anything he would ever have known in his life up to that day. And then he went on and he said, you know, my life was very challenging. I was troubled, he said, on every side. But it couldn't stop me. He said, I was perplexed and lost many times not knowing what to do. He said, but never did it take me into despair. He said, I was persecuted, but it couldn't stop me. It couldn't beat me down. There was an excellency of God's power working on the inside of me. He said there were times I was cast down and didn't know if I was going to make it another moment. But I want you to know the excellency of his power took me through. But the context of enjoying the excellency of that power that's in us is in the context of renouncing the hidden things of darkness and ungodliness and craftiness. And sometimes I wonder if we find ourselves in a sense powerless because we're holding on to those pockets of darkness for whatever reason. I don't know. What do you think? When I use those terms like pockets of darkness, do you, are you connected with that? You with me? Everybody understands? Are we kind of on a, are we in an arena that this is pretty understandable? Are we hopefully smashing some toes today? I mean, we're not trying to do that, but I just know that happens. Let me end by saying integrity rejoices, and I won't cover this the way that I would have liked to. But in the end, integrity rejoices, and I'm going to read this for you, and then we'll close out. And I believe there's ministry that God wants to do for some of us. But I wanted to close with this because it's a story about David's life, and it's a psalm that he wrote when he was in the darkest, darkest moments of his life, and he came out, he wrote this psalm. It was Psalm 51, and in verse 1 it said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. I can see those dark dark pockets when you touch them and this sin is ever before me against thee and thee only have I sinned O God and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge behold I was sharpened in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me behold you desire truth on the inside parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. 
that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And here's what I want you to see. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy, the laughter of my salvation. And behold me and uphold me with thy free spirit. I wanted to end there because you see David had made some very, 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 very bad choices. And when the Spirit of God came and put his fingers on those pockets of darkness, he struggled. He struggled and he couldn't break free. He couldn't come clean. He struggled. He had a hard time. And for almost a year, he was agonizing over the fact that he could no longer sense God's presence. That's what happens in our heart when we allow that spirit of adultery to minister to us. It breaks the connection. God hasn't moved, but we sure have. And David was agonizing over the fact he had lost this, but he didn't know how to come clean, and he didn't know what to do, because if everybody found out what really happened, then the penalty was death. He was the king on top of that, and of course the king should be like above everybody and live an even a better life than the rest of them. I mean, that's the least we should expect from leadership, right? By the way, Dad, you are the leader of the house. That's, that's what it means. It means you're the leader. You're the clean one. You're the sanctified one. You're the holy one. You're the one that makes sure it stays sweet and the presence of God's there. You see, you see isn't that nice? He didn't know what to do. He struggled. He struggled. He was, he was struggling. He, he, he could no longer sense God's presence. And so because God's so merciful, God tapped a man on the shoulder by the name of Nathan. And he said, go talk to him and tell him. Tell him a story about a rich man who had hundreds of sheep. And he had a visitor come in from out of town. And instead of the rich man killing one of his sheep, in feeding his visitor, he went to another man's field and he stole the only lamb he had. And he killed it to feed his visitor. Tell David that story and see what he does. We told David the story and David got angry and infuriated. And he said, show me the man who's done this thing and I'll have his head. I'll kill him. I'll take care of this. No man should ever act this way. And of course, Nathan looked at him and said, well, geez, David, you are that guy. And of course, it penetrated his heart. That was the presence of God. That was the spirit of God. That was the spirit that broke through and penetrated deep into his heart. Now the question is, would he obey? And he did. He fell down and said, only before you, God. Only before you. You alone I've sinned against. You alone I've done the wrong thing. You alone are the one, you alone, this is really between me and you. It may affect a lot of other people that I owe an apology to, but it's really you. And that day, David got something that he didn't know he'd ever get back again. The most important thing that he ever had, and that was the presence of God. That was an awareness that God was in me. That was an awareness I could feel him, I could sense him. Sometimes you can still have that presence and still push back on those pockets of darkness, but you trust me, you can't do that forever. God, it is really still in here. (laughs) And here's what I heard God say. There's two things I believe God wants to do. Number one, I believe there's hidden things in us. Now listen to this. These hidden things are things that 
are there because of what other people did to you. There's things hidden in you because of things that others have done to you and things that are happened to you when you were little and you've never ever been able to really deal with them. And so you're not able to move forward. You're, because of Ankin, they couldn't go forward. And because of things that happened to us, and, and, and we, I mean, we're not trying not to go forward. We're not trying to resist it. It, it just comes with pain, and it comes with shame, and it comes with things. And, and, and those things, they, 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 they hold us. They hold us, and, and we don't know how to break out. And we don't want someone to know, and, and we don't want people to see us this way. And we get all these thoughts but if we'll just tell somebody and get a little bit of prayer, just like, just like God said, tell your wife, man, that your head's full of all this trash. She'll be okay. Have her pray for you. And there will be a power that will change your life forever. It's exactly what happened. I believe there's an anointing to help people. And so that's the first one. The second, the second call is this. I, I keep seeing this crazy lady over here. <laughs> and so the second call is this, that there, there are pockets of darkness in us. And you know God's visited you. And you know God's talked to you again and again and again and again and again. But you're going to have to put it in the light with somebody. You're going to have to tell them. You're going to have to get a little accountability. You're going to have to allow someone to lay hands on you and believe that there will come some assistance through the anointing that can do something in you that you couldn't do on your own just like David couldn't do it on his own. He couldn't do it. I mean, he hated what he had. He hated it. But he couldn't get free. And, and we're human. We're the same way. You with me? So what I'm going to ask the praise team to do is I'm going to ask them to just begin to lead us in worship. Now listen to me. Do not leave with anything. Do not leave with anything. Do not. Do not. You cannot deal with it on your own. You cannot. Doesn't mean we're bad people, it just means we got pockets of darkness. What do you think? All right, let's stand up on our feet. I'm gonna ask some people to come up front that I've talked to. They're gonna they're gonna help minister to people that to you that come up. They're gonna pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Maureen's going to come up and pray for you. Pastor Joan will come up and pray for you. Um, but, but as we worship, don't talk. Don't, let's, let's let this be a holy time. You know, this is a holy moment, church. This is a holy moment where God wants to do some things. And as they begin to sing, you begin to make your way up. And if someone's up here being ministered to and you're, you just stand back far enough to let them finish. And when they're finished, then they'll go to you. And if you got to wait 10 minutes, it's okay. If you got to wait 15 minutes, it's okay. And you know, in Psalm 51, that he was reading about the clean heart, Pastor Jones been teaching three weeks about joy. And if you look in Psalm 51, it talks about the joy of the, your salvation. But the joy comes, if you notice in Psalm 51, when David said, give me a clean heart. And if maybe you've been struggling, having a little bit of joy, it might be because you've got to do step one of saying, create in me a clean heart. And then
then restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Joy cometh in the morning, and joy and intimacy comes where there is honesty. So, Pastor Scott, did you make the call of what you're asking them to come up for so they understand? Y'all got y'all? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Okay, so as we begin to worship, if you want ministry, if you know God has touched areas in your life, please do not leave without hands laid on you. 